Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the fourth quarter 2019 Midland States Bancorp Incorporated Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants' lines are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star then one on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star then zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today. Mr. Tony Rossi of Financial Profiles. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, Crystal. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Midland States Bancorp fourth quarter 2019 earnings call. Joining us from Midland's management team are Jeff Ludwig, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Eric Lemke, Chief Financial Officer. We will be using a slide presentation as part of our discussion this morning. If you have not done so already, please visit the webcast and presentations page of Midland's Investor Relations website to download a copy of the presentation. The management team will discuss the fourth quarter results, and then we will open up the call for questions. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that this conference call contains forward-looking statements with respect to the future performance and financial condition of Midland States Bancorp that involve risks and uncertainties. Various factors could cause actual results to be materially different from any future results expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. These factors are discussed in the company's SEC filings, which are available on the company's website. The company disclaims any obligation to update any forward-looking statements made during the call. Additionally, management may refer to non-GAAP measures, which are intended to supplement but not substitute for the most directly comparable GAAP measures. The press release available on the website contains the financial and other quantitative information to be discussed today, as well as the reconciliation of the GAAP to non-GAAP measures. And with that, I'd like to turn the call over to Jeff. Jeff? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Midland States Earnings Call. I'm going to start on slide three with the highlights of the fourth quarter. We generated $0.51 cents in earnings per share, which included a $1.6 million valuation adjustment to mortgage servicing rights, in our commercial FHA business, which impacted earnings per share by five cents. During the fourth quarter, we also recorded integration and acquisition expense, a loss on the repurchase of subordinated debt, and a net gain on security sales. On an adjusted basis, we had 64 cents in earnings per share. We ended the year with a strong quarter in business development. Our total loans increased at an annualized rate of 6.7%. We had another good quarter of commercial loan growth, driven primarily by our equipment finance business, which continues to produce loans and leases with the more attractive risk-adjusted yields that we are targeting. Over the course of 2019, we successfully executed on our balance sheet management strategies. Towards that end, this put us in a favorable position from a liquidity standpoint to be more active in growing our consumer loan portfolio which contributed to the stronger loan growth in the fourth quarter. We also had a very successful quarter in deposit gathering, with our total deposits increasing at an annualized rate of 8.8%. Once again, this deposit growth was entirely driven by core deposits. We have introduced some new depository products for commercial customers, and we continue to be very active in our calling efforts. This has resulted in strong inflows of core deposits from new customers, as well as getting more of the wallet share from existing customers. Improving our deposit mix was one of our top priorities in 2019, and we're very pleased with the success we have had in this area. The strong inflow of core deposits enabled us to steadily run off higher cost broker deposits. As a result, our net non-core funding dependency ratio declined to 7.8% at the end of 2019, down from 17.9% at the end of the prior year. We also continue to make good progress on another key initiative, improving our efficiency ratio. With the successful integration of Homestar Bank's core system conversion in October, we were able to recognize additional cost saves from this acquisition. This resulted in our efficiency ratio further improving to 59.5% in the fourth quarter, down from 60.6% in the prior quarter. Finally, we continued to effectively manage our capital. Our earnings continue to rebuild our TCE ratio, another key priority for us in 2019. Compared to the end of the prior year, our TCE ratio increased 32 basis points 
despite the impact of the Homestar acquisition. We also continue making what we believe is an attractive investment for the company through our stock repurchase program. As we repurchased approximately 85,000 shares during the fourth quarter at an average price of $25.69 per share, while also continuing to pay an attractive dividend to our shareholders. At this point, I want to introduce our new Chief Financial Officer, Eric Lemke. Eric joined Midland in 2018 as our Director of Assurance and Audit, and we have been very impressed with his business and financial acumen during his time here. Eric was previously the CFO of Metropolitan Capital Bank Corp. in Chicago and also served as a partner in the financial services practice at RSM. So we are very confident that he has the experience and skill set to effectively lead our finance team. Now, Eric is going to walk us through more details on the financial performance in the quarter. Eric. Thanks, Jeff, and and good morning again, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start with our loan portfolio on slide four. Uh, Our total loans outstanding increased $72.6 million from the end of the prior quarter, driven, as Jeff mentioned earlier, by growth in the commercial and the consumer loan portfolios. Our commercial loans and leases portfolio was up 7.4% on a linked quarter basis, largely due to the growth in our equipment finance business. The outstanding balances in our equipment finance business increased $66.8 million from the end of the prior quarter, or 11.8%. Our consumer portfolio increased $100 million from the end of the prior quarter, which represented all of the growth in this portfolio during during 2019. As we've indicated in the past, we have a lot of flexibility in our consumer loan production and can increase production when it makes sense from a liquidity and a balance sheet management standpoint, as it did during the fourth quarter. The growth in the commercial and consumer portfolios helped helped to offset continued runoff in the commercial real estate portfolio, where we continue to see elevated payoffs being driven by aggressive pricing offered in our markets. In addition, the declining interest rate environment impacted our loan yields during the fourth quarter as yields, including accretion income, declined by nine basis points to 5.22%. Turning to deposits on slide five, total deposits were five point or 4.54 billion at the end of the fourth quarter, an increase of approximately $99 million from the end of the prior quarter. Substantially, all the growth came in our checking and our money market balances, which is attributable to the success of the deposit gathering initiatives that Jeff previously discussed. Also, during the fourth quarter, we intentionally reduced our balances of brokered time deposits by another $44 million. With this runoff, brokered time deposits represented just 1% of our total deposits at the end of 2019, down from 4% at the end of the prior year. Our overall cost of deposits dropped four basis points to 0.8% in the fourth quarter, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. And turning to that that next slide, let's talk a little bit about net interest income and our net interest margin. Our net interest income decreased 1.5% from the prior quarter. Excluding the impact of accretion income, our net interest margin declined 17 basis points from the prior quarter. As we expected, the increase in subordinated debt following our $100 million issuance in September of 2019 put pressure on our margin. And in the fourth quarter, the additional sub-debt negatively impacted our margin by eight basis points. The strong deposit growth that we saw in the quarter increased our level of cash balances. Combined with lower rates earned on those cash balances, the excess liquidity negatively impacted our margin by another seven basis points. And then as a result of the 75 basis point reduction in Fed funds rates that occurred over a period of three months in mid to late 2019, lower average loan yields negatively impacted our margin by four basis points. All of these factors were partially offset by lower rates on deposits, resulting from a reduction in rates on certain deposit accounts and the improvement in our deposit mix. Now, looking ahead, we see a a number of factors that should have a positive impact on our net interest margin as we move throughout the year 2020. 
In particular, we'll be redeeming our high cost, higher cost subordinated debt in June of 2020. We also have approximately 280 million of time deposits maturing from March through June that should renew at much lower rates. We expect to continue to see a positive shift in our deposit mix and pass through more of the recent rate cuts to our depositors, which should further lower our cost of deposits. And we expect that the higher yielding equipment finance portfolio will continue to comprise a larger percentage of our overall loan mix. So assuming no changes in the Fed funds rate going forward, we believe that these factors can help stabilize our net interest margin during the first half of 2020, excluding the impact of accretion income, and then help us move back towards the 3.5% range in the second half of the year. On a reported basis, we will still see some downward pressure on our net interest margin as our scheduled accretion trends lower throughout the year. Now turning to wealth management on slide seven. At the end of the quarter, our assets under administration were $3.41 billion, an increase of $129 million from the end of the prior quarter. That increase was primarily attributable to improved market performance during the quarter. Our wealth management revenue decreased 10.4% from the prior quarter to $5.4 million, which was primarily attributable to a decline in our estate fees. Turning to slide eight, non-interest income. Our total non-interest income decreased 3.0% from the prior quarter to $19.0 million. In the fourth quarter, our non-interest income included a 0.6 or $600,000 in net gains on sales of investment securities. The decline from the prior quarter was primarily due to two factors, the decline in lower wealth management and lower commercial FHA revenue. Our commercial FHA revenue was negatively impacted this quarter by a $1.6 million impairment to mortgage servicing rights in this business. Those declines were partially offset by an increase in bridge loan fees generated from referrals through love funding, which are recognized in other non-interest income. Looking ahead over the long term, we still expect commercial FHA revenue to range from 12 million to 20 million annually. However, given that the operating environment for commercial FHA remains similar to the conditions that we saw in 2019, we expect revenue from this business to be fairly similar to what we saw during this past year. Turning to slide nine and our expenses and efficiency ratio, we incurred $3.3 million in integration and acquisition expense in the fourth quarter a $1.8 million loss on the repurchase of subordinated debt, and a loss on mortgage servicing rights held for sale of $95,000. Excluding these adjustments, our non-interest expense decreased 3.9% on a linked quarter basis. That decline was primarily due to additional cost savings realized after the Homestar system conversion was completed in October. As a result of the decline in our expense levels, our efficiency ratio improved to 59.5% compared to 60.6% in the prior quarter. Moving to slide 10, we'll take a look at asset quality. We saw a general improvement in asset quality this quarter as reflected by the decline in our non-performing loans and net charge-offs compared to the prior quarter. We recorded a provision for loan losses of $5.3 million during the quarter. This reflected the stronger growth we had in the loan portfolio. The provision also included a $1.4 million specific reserve established for an existing non-performing loan when that property was put on the market at a lower price than our most recent appraisal data. This particular loan is unrelated to the non-performing loan that impacted our provision expense during the prior quarter. The fourth quarter provision brought our allowance to loan losses to 64 basis points of total loans at December 31st, and our credit marks accounted for another 39 basis points. Now, let me provide a few comments on our expectations for the implementation of CECL. 
Based on our loan portfolio balances and current economic forecasts at the end of 2019, our best estimate of the increase to the allowance for loan losses and reserve for unfunded commitments from the implementation of CECL is approximately 20 to $25 million. This range reflects the uncertainty of economic forecasts used to record those additional reserves. We are continuing to finalize these and certain other key assumptions used in our CECL model and methodologies. Looking ahead at this point in the economic cycle, while we continue to see generally healthy trends in the portfolio, we've seen a continuation of one-off credit events impacting our net charge-offs and provision expense. These one-off credit events have not been concentrated within any particular industry or property type. And we're not seeing broad weakness in our portfolio in ag loans, retail loans, healthcare loans, or any of the other industries where there is concern on a macro level. Our portfolio continues to be very well diversified, and the one-off credit events we have seen have been in unique situations that haven't been related to deteriorating fundamentals in any particular industry. For that reason, we're expecting our quarterly provision expense to be in that three to $4 million range during 2020. However, that'd be under current economic conditions. Under CECL, provision expenses will be subject to more volatility depending on changes in those economic forecasts and a variety of other factors. So with that, I'll turn the call back over to Jeff. Jeff? Thanks, Eric. We'll wrap up on slide 11 with some comments on the outlook for 2020. Since our IPO in 2016, we have acquired three banks and two wealth management businesses. As a result, in a period of three and a half years, we have doubled our total assets and had substantial growth in our wealth management business. As we start 2020, our focus will be squarely on organic earnings growth and improving our performance metrics, including our efficiency ratio, which we are targeting to be under 60% on a sustainable basis by the end of the year. If an attractive acquisition opportunity emerges, we certainly will consider it, but that not, is not our focus for 2020. We believe that our shareholders will be best served if we utilize 2020 to focus on optimizing the performance of the, of the existing bank and continuing to build our tangible book value per share. From a balance sheet management perspective, we expect to have a continuation of the trends we experienced in 2019. We expect low single-digit organic loan growth, primarily driven by continued growth in our equipment finance portfolio. We also expect to have continued success in gathering core deposits and improving our deposit mix. We'd like to continue to keep our loan to deposit ratio in the mid 90%. Although we expect just modest balance sheet growth this year, we believe we are well positioned to generate a year of strong earnings growth for a number of reasons. First, we will have a full year of realizing the synergies from the Homestar acquisition. Second, we will, continue, we will complete the consolidation of the previously announced six branches by the end of the first quarter, which will reduce the costs associated with our branch network. Third, Earlier this week, we made adjustments in our staffing levels that reflect the shift in, in customer preferences towards digital and mobile banking and our continued focus on efficiency. We eliminated approximately 50 full-time employee positions, with approximately 30% of those positions coming out of our retail branches, and the remainder primarily coming from back office support and non-revenue generating positions. These staffing adjustments will result in approximately $3.9 million in annualized cost savings beginning in the second quarter. Following these staffing adjustments, we expect our quarterly run rate for non-interest expense to be in the range of $42 to $43 million per quarter in 2020. Fourth, we will leverage the significant investments we have made in technology over the past few years to drive additional efficiencies further streamline our operations, and enhance our digital banking experience. And fifth, as Eric laid out earlier, we expect to see an expansion in our net interest margin later in the year, which should help drive an increase in our net interest income. We believe that solid execution on these initiatives will put us in a good position to deliver strong earnings growth in 2020 
and further improve the level of returns that we generate for our shareholders. With that, we'll be happy to answer any questions anyone has. Operator, please open the call. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press the star followed by the number one key on your touchtone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. Once again, to ask a question, please press star and then one now. And our first question comes from Michael Perito from KBW. Your line is open. Hey, good morning. Happy New Year. Yep, good Good morning, Mike. Um, I want to start, so I obviously appreciate all the forward-looking commentary, um, but I want to start maybe just on the credit side. You know, I mean, I mean you provided a pretty much a 40 basis point rate last year, you know, clearly pretty pretty high above where, where most of your peers are. Um, but it sounds like the, the portfolio, you, you know, you guys still remain confident in kind of the makeup and underwriting of the portfolio. And then, so I'm just trying to pull all the pieces together here. I mean, do, what type of loss content does the 3 to $4 million provision for next year assume? Does it assume that charge-offs remain slightly higher than peers like you experienced in 2019 and then, you know, the low single-digit growth or are there other assumptions that kind of make up that that provision expectation? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, we're looking, if, if you look back at 19, we probably averaged about $4 million a quarter. Um, we think that will come down slightly and, and, and the range that we gave of, of three to four kind of puts us in that, in that range. Um, I think charge-offs, uh, we probably think are probably going to look a little bit like 19. Um, you know, we do have, uh, as we disclose, you know, more detail around our allowance, we do have a fair amount of specific reserves that are sitting in the allowance today. So as those get resolved, we could see some, some charge-offs come through on, on those specific reserves, but those are already provided for. So kind of excluding maybe that group of loans, you know, we don't we probably expect a, a under 20 basis point kind of charge off level um, as we look at the portfolio today and and, um, and and the diversification that we have. Okay, um, helpful. Thanks. And um, switching over to the margin. Um, can you guys? I guess two part question. One, can you remind me? You know, if if there is another cut in in Fed funds, you know, what kind of the negative sensitivity to the margin would be in in that scenario? Um, and then secondly, can you just provide a little bit more color uh, on on the kind of time deposit repricing opportunity as you see it today? Maybe where the kind of the yields on the book are, and where the you know the new yields are coming in, and what the potential pickup could be there. That that seems to be a big driver of the potential margin pickup in the back half of the year. Yeah, that's a, a good question. So I guess I'll start with the time deposits. So we've got, a, um, we did quite a few CD specials during the first and second quarter last year at this time. And so we've got about 280 million that are going to be maturing between March and um, June. And so the way we're kind of modeling it is we think there's potentially an 80 basis point pickup. However, we're also modeling that we won't be able to retain necessarily all of those funds. Um, but that's a that's a pretty significant pickup to that during the course of the next year. Okay, and then um, the uh, sensitivities on the potential for another cut in the Fed funds. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll take that one. I, you know, we'll we'll I think what we'll, what we'll see is what we saw in the in the fourth quarter. We'll see initial pressure on the asset side, and then uh, it will take us a quarter or two to continue to adjust. Um, uh, deposit rates across the board, so there'll be somewhat of a lag. So I think we'll we would see some initial pressure, and then uh, be able to work it back. But the initial pressure, I mean, the fourth quarter compression in the core margin, I mean, there were that was partly debt, partly liquidity driven. I mean, it wouldn't be to that magnitude, right? It would probably be something in like the three to five basis point range, and then work back over time. Is that is that a fair way to think about it? Just in a you know kind of isolated. Yeah, I think so. I mean, eight, eight basis points was, was sub debt. Seven basis point was additional liquidity. So yeah, it'd be it would be more in that mid single digit basis point range. Okay, and then uh, just you know, as, as I think about capital here, Jeff, um, you know, 2019 was was a, a, a you know saw your capital levels build, and and based on the efficiency and recent profitability, kind of 
production. I would think that will continue next year. Um, you know, it seems like it's still another kind of internally focused year of kind of sustaining the, the improvements you guys have made in returns and then kind of expanding on that if you can. D- does that lend to maybe kind of behind the scenes utilizing share repurchases and, and deploying some capital that way or, or any updated thoughts, I guess, just in general about capital deployment outside of M&A and organic growth? Yeah, and, uh, so maybe I'll start with dividends. You know, we have a, a, a long track record, I think probably 15-year track record of increasing dividends by, by 10%. So, you know, we're going to continue to pay a, a good dividend. We, we do have a share repurchase program. We've used it, I'll say, defensively to this point um, as our stock price, um, you know, as you saw in the fourth quarter, we, we when we bought, we bought in the $25 range. Um, and I think, at least in the short term, we're going to continue to use it defensively. You know, the, our TCE ratio is still not to eight. We'd like to ideally get to, to above eight, so we, we need to continue to work the TCE ratio up. We need to continue to work book value um, up, and, and as you know, as you buy your stock back, uh, that works against you. So I think we'll continue to use it defensively, continue to build tangible book value, continue to continue to build TCE, and then as the TCE ratio begins to get back over eight, you know, maybe we'll we'll use that that share buyback um, in a different way, but um, I think we got it. We have to get there first. Okay, um, helpful. Thank you guys. Uh, appreciate you taking all my questions. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Our next question comes from Terry McAvoy from Stevens. Your line is open. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Terry. First off, thanks for all the disclosure around day one and, and day two, Cecil. Very helpful. Um, and, and I also understand the drivers of the margin upside from 4Q through, I guess, the second half of next year. I believe in the past you have provided some thoughts on, on accretion. I know you said accretion would, would come down, which would impact the reported NIM. But, but any thoughts on accretion over the next uh, two to four quarters or, or for full year, 19, uh, full year 2020? Yeah, the challenge we're having right now is some of that accretion kind of goes out of accretion and goes into, I'll say, normalized our normalized margin number, and we're still trying to get our hands around what that looks like. So, yeah, I, in, in pure dollars, it's probably four or five million dollar decrease uh, year over year, something, mm-hmm. something like that. Um, now, whether that as we get into 2020, shows up in that line item or not, that's where it gets a little confusing with the adoption of CECL. Um, okay. So there is, there's I don't know, four or five million dollars ahead win there. Okay, and then moving over to, to fee income, um, the wealth management, I've got in my notes here, seasonality and estate fees put pressure on wealth management fees. So what are your thoughts on that line of business in 2020? And then on the FHA, just so I'm clear, if, if 2020 looks like, looks pretty similar to 2019, does that include the, the MSR impairment, or should we adjust for any MSR volatility that was experienced in 19? So regarding FHA, if rates stay the same, we don't expect more impairment in that, in that portfolio. Um, so I, I would say it excludes the impairment part of the revenue. Uh, I think you were even looking at maybe from a disclosure point of view, pulling that out of that revenue line and disclosing that separately on the income statement, but that, that's for another day. Um, on the on the wealth business, we've, we've changed our revenue recognition um, late in the year around estate fees. So that should, as we get into 2020, begin to um, be more... Um, normalized through through each of the quarters. So we'll begin to recognize the state fees as we earn them um, instead of when the estate closes. So that was providing some, uh, if you will, lumpiness in in the revenue line. Um, that should start to smooth out a little. I mean, we, we continue to have a fair amount of estates that we're working on. Uh, so that, that revenue line should start to smooth out a little bit. Um, and I think we're positioned well with the increase in assets in the back part of the year to begin to drive revenue increases from that fourth quarter revenue line or that revenue number in the fourth quarter. And then just one last follow-up. 
the 42 to 43 million dollars of expenses in 2020 on a quarterly basis do you feel good about the, that number for q1 given the, the comments earlier about the fde reductions and and the benefit not showing up until the second quarter I think it would probably be on the higher end of that that range in the first quarter, um, and now that include, um, yeah, I think the higher end of that range in the first quarter. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Yep, thanks. Thank you. And again, ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, please press star and then one now. And our next question comes from Andrew Leish from Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Andrew. Uh, just follow-up question here on the margin, just with the the excess liquidity that's been sitting on the balance sheet. Um, just kind of thoughts on w- what's the plan with that? Is that going to be how's that going to be deployed, and what, what sort of timing uh, do you anticipate with that? Yeah, so we've been working hard um, to to address our our excess liquidity, and you know I think um, with with some some modest loan growth. Uh, we do have some additional non-core uh, uh, liabilities that we'll continue to, to pay down. Um, as Eric said earlier, as those that $280 million of CDs repriced, we'll, there'll be some attrition associated with that. Um, and, 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 and we've made some additional um, investments in the investment portfolio itself. So um, in the short term, you know, that's what we're doing to address that liquidity. Um, okay, great. Uh, you've uh, you've covered all my other questions. All right, thanks. Thank you. And I am showing no further questions from our phone lines, and I'd like to turn the conference back over to management for any closing remarks. Yeah, thanks for uh, joining today, and we will see you uh, next quarter. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in today's conference. This does conclude the program. You may all disconnect. Everyone, have a great day.